Good morning. I am Pastor Ed Thomas, and we welcome you to Spirit of Joy. Let us turn our hearts to worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Can you believe that it has been almost exactly one year that we have been recording services? Everything began to shut down, and our first Sunday where we recorded something was on March the 14th. And I tell you what, we were so unsophisticated. We had it in four or five different parts. Watch this first, it's the introduction and the confession. Watch this, it's a song. Watch this, it's the sermon. We have come a long way. But on March 14th this year, we have new technology in the sanctuary, and we are going to stop pre-recording services get us back in the habit of Sunday morning is worship time, that you can watch it later in the days and the weeks, but it is going to be live streamed. And I'm so excited, one, that people are getting their vaccines now and more are beginning to come back. We feel safer now. Uh, in the midst of that also, I'm so excited that I don't have to do video editing. If you listen to my wife, it took me at least two days every week to put together our services and to be freed up for the normal pieces of ministry. I can't wait. So it was exactly March 14 that we posted our first online service. And on March 14 this year, no more online pre-recorded services just live streamed. So 8.30, we're going to continue on Facebook. 11 o'clock, we are going to do, uh, with this new technology that we have, we thank Paul Happel. He has done such wonderful work to put us in the place where we can worship in a new way for a new year, for we're tired of 2020. Anyway. Let us turn our hearts now to worship this day. Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. God created us to experience joy and communion with him. But sin separates us from God, our neighbors, and creation. 
and so we do not enjoy the life our Creator intended for us. By our sin, we grieve our Father, who does not desire us to come under His judgment, but to turn to Him and live. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Hear the good news. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sin. Amen. said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, today you will be with me in paradise.
Christ rose from the dead, death no longer has any power over him. When we die with Christ, we are set free from the power of sin. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we too may live new lives. There is peace with God through Jesus Christ. The peace of Christ be with you always. Repentance, fasting, prayer, and works of love, the discipline of Lent, help us to wage our spiritual warfare. Lord, help us commit ourselves to this struggle and give us strength to persevere in our Lenten discipline. Help us to fast from judging others and feast on your Son who dwells in them. Help us to fast from fear and feast on Christ's strength Help us to fast from words that pollute and feast on speech that purifies. Help us to fast from anger, bitterness, and discontent and feast on patience, kindness, forgiveness, and gratitude. Help us to fast from problems that overwhelm and feast on prayer that sustains. Help us to fast from our self-concern and feast on you. Lord Jesus, you are our King and intercessor. Hear our prayers as we come to you today. For all pastors and missionaries who boldly proclaim your name. And for the strengthening of God's people in their journey of faith. For Christ's church across time and place. Extend your protection over us as we stand against powers and principalities of this present darkness for the mission of this congregation, and for the work you have given each of us to do. And for those who have wandered from your flock. For science and invention, for artisans and teachers, for tradespeople and laborers. For first responders and military personnel, and for those who serve us in the medical arts. For the hungry and homeless, for the unemployed and underemployed and for those who work and volunteer in agencies that bless our communities. For a giving spirit, that we may bless your church and kingdom. And never fail to neglect the poor. For those afflicted by illness of mind or body. For those nearing the end of their earthly journey, and for all who grieve. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we here remember the suffering and death of your dear Son, Jesus Christ. It was a king's gift for our salvation. Trusting in the power that raised Jesus victoriously from the grave, we come to you in confidence as we pray, both silently and aloud. Our first lesson is from the book of James, chapter 4. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder. And you covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Adulterers. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you suppose that it is for nothing that Scripture says God yearns jealously for the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? But he gives all the more grace. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second lesson is Psalm 19. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. 
There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In the heavens he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit is to the end of them, and nothing is hid from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them there is great reward. But who can detect their errors? Clear me from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from the insolent. Do not let them have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the second chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He, hold, he told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's begin with prayer. Please bow your heart with me. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you. Amen. Today, we are continuing our sermon series on the book of James. We've already learned that wisdom is the ability to make the right choice that it is wise to have faith in the Lord, and that we should respond to what God has done for us with our good works. Last time, we looked at chapter 3 and learned more about what James has to say about wisdom, the tongue, and sin. In chapter 4, James teaches us a bit more about the tongue and a bit more about sin. He also teaches us about God's grace. So let's start today with what James has to say about the tongue. You may recall that in chapter 3, he warned 
that the tongue may be small, but it can wield great power and influence. He also said it can be difficult to control. Here in chapter 4, James gives some explicit advice about how to use the tongue from the perspective of what not to say. Look at verses 11 and 12. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers and sisters. Whoever speaks evil against another or judges another speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver and judge who is able to save and to destroy. So who then are you to judge your neighbor? When James says not to speak against another brother or sister, he's saying not to slander another Christian. And he is saying that to do so is to break the law. And in particular, what Jesus said about loving our neighbors as ourselves. In other words, just as we learned in chapters 2 and 3, we should always examine our attitudes and actions towards others. Do we build people up or do we tear people down? Whenever we're about to criticize someone, James is saying we should remember God's law of love and say something good about the person instead. If we make that a habit, we will tend to find fault with others less often, and we will tend to obey God's law of love more often. So, James tells us that it is not wise to use our tongue to say anything that is slanderous. He also warns us that it is not wise to use our tongue to say anything that is arrogant. Look at verses 13 through 16. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a town and spend a year there doing business and making money. Yet you do not even know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wishes, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast. You boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Remember, we learned that James was greatly influenced by Proverbs. What he is saying here in verses 16, uh, 13 through 16 is based on Proverbs 27, which says, Do not boast for tomorrow, for you do not know what a day will bring. So James is not arguing against making money. He's arguing against having an arrogant attitude. He also is not rejecting the importance of setting goals or planning. Few things in life are accomplished by accident. That is why it is important for us to set specific goals and make plans. But what James is saying is that when we set goals and make plans, it is wise to always seek God's guidance rather than simply aiming for our own earthly ambitions. He is saying that it is arrogant to forget that God is ultimately in control of tomorrow. In other words, it's okay to use our tongues to state our goals as long as we don't leave God out of those goals. Saying that tomorrow will run as we have planned is unwise and arrogant. Now that leads us to our next topic, sin. Arrogance is a form of pride, and pride is one of the most prevalent sins. Look at verse 
uh, 15 again. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wishes, we will live and do this or that. But our pride says, no, I don't want to do it God's way. I want to do it my way. That's what happened in the Garden of Eden. The serpent tempted Adam and Eve to eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil so that they could be like God. And they wanted to be like God. In fact, they wanted to be their own God. And that first sin of rebellious pride has been inherited by every one of us. Each of us tries to rely on ourselves, to be self-sufficient, and to be our own God. That is one of the consequences of the fall. I like the way Max Licato describes it. He offers a little quiz to see how well you do with self-reliance. He says, Raise your hand if any of the following describes you. Number one, you can control your moods. You are never grumpy or sullen. You can't relate to Jekyll and Hyde. You are always upbeat and upright. Does that describe you? No? Okay, let's try another. Number two. You are at peace with everyone. Every relationship you have is as sweet as honey. Even your old flames speak highly of you. You love all and are loved by all. Is that you? No? Okay, let's try another. Number three. You have no fears. Everyone calls you Teflon Tuffy. Wall Street plummets, no problem. Heart condition discovered, yawn. World War III starts, what's for dinner? Is that you? No? Number four, you need no forgiveness. You never make a mistake. You are as square as a game of checkers, and you are as clean as grandma's kitchen. You have never cheated, you have never lied, and you have never lied about cheating. Is that you? No? Okay, let's evaluate this. You can't control your moods. A few of your relationships are shaky. You have fears, and you have false. Hmm. Do you really want to rely on yourself? That's what Max Licato says. And the point that James is making is that pride gets in the way of doing what is wise. Pride is what keeps the alcoholic from admitting their drinking problem. Pride is what causes the person to refuse to ask for help with their problems. Pride is what keeps us from saying, I'm sorry. Frequently, at the beginning of our worship service, we quote 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, and say, If we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Did you notice that word, if? If we confess our sins? You see, confessing our sins, that is, admitting our failures, is very difficult because of our pride. Max Licato says we rationalize it away like this. Well, I might not be perfect, but I'm better than Hitler 
and certainly kinder than Edie Amin. Me, a sinner? Oh, sure, I get rowdy every so often, but I'm a pretty good person. Listen, I'm just as good as anybody else. I pay my taxes. I coach Little League. I even make donations to the Red Cross. Why, God is probably proud to have someone like me on his team. Max Licato goes on to say, justification, rationalization, comparison, these are the tools of the devil. They sound good. They sound familiar. They even sound American. But in the kingdom, they sound hollow. Pride is a sin. And just like it was for Adam and Eve, our quest for self-reliance and self-sufficiency apart from God leads to our downfall. Look at verse 2. You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder. And you covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. Now, we know that God told us in the Ten Commandments that we are not to commit murder and we are not to covet. Those are sins. And we know, because of God's law of love, that when we get into a dispute or a conflict with someone, we might not be loving them like God loves them. And that is a sin. When we let our tongues speak with arrogance, we sin. When we let our tongues slander someone, we sin. When we don't speak with God's love, we sin. But, in addition, look at verse 17. Anyone then who knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, commits sin. We tend to think that sin is doing wrong. But James tells us here that sin is also not doing right. It is a sin to lie, but it can also be a sin to know the truth and not tell it. It is a sin to speak evil of someone, but it is also a sin to avoid them when we know that they need to hear a kind word from us. In other words, James is telling us that it is a sin if we do what we know we should not do and that it is a sin if we do not do what we know we should do. And with that in mind, how do you think God views a Christian who once walked with him but now doesn't? How do you think God views the Christian who once knew the power of the Holy Spirit but now ignores it? I'm talking about the person who has become so entangled with the world that he or she hardly ever picks up the Bible to read it anymore, or the person who rarely prays anymore, or the person who only occasionally comes to church, you know, when it fits into the schedule. How do you think God views that? Well, look at what James says in verse 4. Adulterers, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. And the Greek word 
that James used and was translated here as becomes means to constitute or to render or to cause. And this is very important because it alerts us to the fact that when Christians choose to take a worldly path, they set themselves up in direct opposition to the godly path that the Lord desires for them. In other words, they have constituted or rendered or caused themselves to become the enemy of God. Think of it like this. How do you feel when your teenager breaks one of your rules? Or how do you feel when someone you love ignores you and shows little interest in what you do and what you say? Or how do you feel when you realize that someone has cheated on you? Don't those times make you feel like the other person is behaving like your enemy? Those probably are not the times when you are apt to say, I love you and I want to give you an amazing gift. Well, James makes it clear that you and I are sinners. But James also makes it clear that God loves us anyway. And that leads to our third topic, grace. Have I ever mentioned Via de Cristo? Have I ever told you that you owe it to yourself to go to Via de Cristo? Well, you do because it is one of the greatest gifts that you could ever give yourself. The first time I attended a Via de Cristo retreat was in 1995. That was 26 years ago, and I still think it is one of the greatest gifts that you could ever give yourself. It was on that retreat where I truly learned the meaning of God's grace. Before that, I thought grace was a prayer you said to offer thanks for a meal. But on that Via Cristo weekend, I learned in a very real and personal way how much God truly loves us. And I learned that grace is a showering upon us of unmerited love and gifts from God. We don't deserve those gifts, and we don't even have to ask for them, but God gives them to us anyway. John, in chapter 1, verse 16 of his gospel, says, From God's fullness we all receive grace upon grace. In other words, we are showered with God's abundant grace. And then, in his first letter, chapter 4, verse 9, John spells out that the greatest gift of grace is when he, what, what it is when he says, God showed how much he loves us by sending his only Son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. Now James has just made it abundantly clear that we do not deserve God's grace, but God gives it to us anyway. James is saying that we are sinners, but God loves us so much that he gives us his amazing grace anyway. James tells us that grace is a repeated invitation 
from God to us for a new relationship with Him. God says, let's wipe that slate clean and start over. That's how much God loves us. And that is grace. Look at verse 5. Or do you suppose that it is for nothing that the Scripture says God yearns jealously for the Spirit that He has made to dwell in us? The Scripture He references is 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, which tells us that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit is in us and that we have received the Holy Spirit from God. God gave us the gift of the Advocate and caused the Holy Spirit to dwell in us to help us, to teach us, to guide us, and to empower us. That's grace. And it would be hard to overestimate God's love for us. The Greek word that is translated in verse 5 as yearns means an intense desire, a craving, a longing, an ache. It usually refers to an intense yearning for something that is morally wrong and sinful. It is typically used to refer to a drug addict or an alcoholic who needs a fix so seriously that they are doubled over, racked with pain, and crying out, please, someone, give me what I need. But James uses that word to say that God has such a deep love and affection for us that it is like He is addicted to us, to us sinners. That is grace. And there is more. The Greek word translated in verse 5 as jealously describes a person who feels rivalry or a person who feels envy or a person who holds a grudge because of someone else's behavior. It also carries the idea of ill will and malice. It is used to describe the emotions of someone who discovers that their spouse is being romantically pursued by someone else. It describes the anger, resentment, envy, and jealousy that the spouse feels because of this threat to the marital relationship. And it describes the rage, the malice, and the ill will that the spouse feels toward the romantic bandit who is trying to tempt the other spouse away. So James is saying that even though we are morally depraved and sinful, God has an all-consuming and passionate desire for us. He is so in love with us that He is jealous and enraged against anyone or anything that competes for our attention. He wants our time. He wants our devotion, and He wants our fellowship. He wants us, He wants all of us, and He sent His Son to die on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins so that we can be with Him for all of eternity. That is grace. And there is even more that we do not have time to cover today. So I do invite you to attend a Via de Cristo retreat. You will learn so much more about God's grace and how much God really loves you. Please see me after church about it. I'll answer any of your questions 
and I'll tell you how you can sign up to attend one of the three weekends we are planning for this fall. You do owe it to yourself to go. My friends, James gives us a balanced view of law and grace. If all we do is thump the Bible and shout God's law as fire and brimstone, we cause people to turn away from God, and they don't hear the good news of salvation. On the other hand, if we ignore God's laws and focus solely on God's grace, we cause people to think that they can go on sinning because God will forgive them anyway. Or, even worse, sometimes we don't even mention God's law because we are afraid we might offend someone. And that means that they never learn God's truth. The fact of the matter is, we are Christians who now live in a non Christian culture. We live in a world that says, have it your way. It's all about you. Do whatever feels good. Post whatever you feel, even if it is slanderous or cruel. Be whoever you think you are, regardless of what the science of biology says. That is the culture we live in today. In addition, we live in a society where our government passes laws that do not conform to God's laws. We live in a non-Christian culture. But James lived in a similar situation. Back then, the Roman culture did not conform to biblical morals either, or to God's designs either, or to God's ideal either. But the wisdom that God shares with us in the book of James is there to help us recognize the difference between our legal rights under society's law versus doing what is right under God's law. So how do we apply all this to our lives today? Well, we need to maintain that balance of law and grace. We need to know what God's law says so that we know what sin is. But at the same time, we need to reflect God's grace and love the sinner. We need to influence voters based on God's law. But we need to treat every voter with respect and avoid the disputes and conflicts that come from aligning with one political party at the expense of influencing another. We need to make it known that there is only one true lawgiver and judge who is able to save and to destroy. But we need to show grace to those who sin because we are just as much of a sinner ourselves. The world doesn't want to do it God's way. But because of what happened in the Garden of Eden, sometimes neither do we. So how do we apply this to our lives today? Well, look at verses 7 and 8. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. James is saying that 
we may not always be able to understand why God requires some of his laws. Sometimes the Bible doesn't answer the why. So sometimes it feels like we ask why, but God answers, because I said so. And nobody likes that answer. But James is saying, obey God's law and remember God's grace. When we realize how much God loves us and how much He wants the best for us, it is easier for us to trust God and to go ahead and obey His law even if we don't know why. We can live like the world, trying to claim our rights and trying to be self-reliant, or we can live for God, giving up our rights and trusting Him to provide what He knows is best for us. When people who do not know God commit sin, that is bad, and it grieves the Lord. That is why we need God's law. But when Christians commit sin, that is really bad, and it really grieves the Lord. And that is why we need God's grace. You see, the truth is, just because we are trying to rely on God doesn't mean we will never sin again. Because we live in this fallen world, we will continue to say hurtful things, to think wrong thoughts, to have inappropriate attitudes, and to behave foolishly. But the good news, my friends, is that James has given us a process by which we can repurify our hearts. When we resist the devil, mourn for our sins, and humbly draw near to God in submission, our Father, in His grace, is always faithful, and He will forgive us and cleanse us. Confession and repentance are like a spiritual shower that washes away the filth of our sin. And grace is like a shower that drenches us with God's love. To control our tongues and turn away from our sins is to know God's law. To submit to God's will and rely on God's provision is to know God's grace. My brothers and sisters, God loves you, and so do I. Amen. Yeah.
Christ is our peace. He has reconciled us to God in one body by the cross. We meet in his name and share in his peace. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have this bread to offer, which the earth has given and human hands have made. Let it become for us the bread of life. Blessed are you, God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have this, the fruit of the vine, to offer, the blessing of your creation and the work of our hands. Let it become for us the blood of your covenant. It is our duty and delight to give you thanks and praise, Almighty God, Holy Father, Heavenly King. Yours, Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the splendor, and the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. And we remember how on the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and after he blessed it, he broke it, and said, Take and eat. This is my body, broken for you. Each time you eat this bread, remember me. Again after supper, he took the cup, and said, this is the new covenant in my blood shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Each time you drink from this cup, remember me. Our Father, who art, art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, come thy, thy will be done, done on earth, earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and, and forgive us our trespasses, trespasses as we forgive, forgive those who trespass against, against us. And, and lead us not into temptation, temptation but deliver, deliver us from evil. evil. For thine, thine is the kingdom, kingdom and the power and the, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The body of Christ broken for you. And the blood of Christ shed for you. shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace.